All right, thank you. Thank you all for your patience. I know it's the last talk of the day, so I appreciate your attention. Um, mostly, uh, I'll be talking about embarking media management and a sub-project called the Video Annotation and Reference System. <clears throat> um, you may hear me refer to them as M3 and VARs. Uh, just real briefly about Embari, we're looking at about 150 kilometers uh, south of San Francisco. We're at the heart of Monterey Bay, <clears throat> and we're at the head of the Monterey Submarine Canyon. Uh, this allows researchers to hop on a boat, go out and do research in thousands of meters of water, and return in time for dinner. So we get a lot of research done. <clears throat> we collect a lot of underwater video. Uh, since 1987, Whenever the ROVs in the water will record every moment, when the video comes back to shore, it's cataloged and annotated, and those annotations are made available to all the researchers and collaborators at Embari. We have three primary platform, uh, platforms for collecting video. We have two ROVs, uh, the dock crickets and the, uh, the Ventana, and then we have uh, an AUV that's specialized for midwater transecting. A typical workflow is at sea. Uh, researchers can annotate in real time, the video comes back to shore, is archived, and then later on, as time permits, it's annotated in more detail, and the annotations are improved. <clears throat> uh, we've been doing this, like I said, for a long time. To date, we have about 27,000 hours of video, over 6 million annotations, and from this data set, we've produced a little bit over 400 peer-reviewed publications, so it's been very productive for us. We started this a long time ago. The first iteration of VARS was written in 2004, it was primarily focused on tapes. In 2015, we started working on all digital formats, and we're modernizing our workflow. And that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. Before we started rewriting the system, we went and interviewed all kinds of groups to get a good feel for what's being done in industry and other agencies. I will make a note that the WWF there is not the World Wildlife uh, Foundation. It's the World Wrestling Federation. They are fantastic at video management. Okay, so three things that we ended up building I'm going to talk about. Our video capture and archiving pipeline, because you're going to ask about it. Uh, our video annotation management services, these are the core that we build our other tools on. And then the various applications that we built that sit on top of these services. Uh, video capture works kind of like this. Video signal comes off our platforms. Uh, it's piped to just off-the-shelf stuff. I've got a little video encoding box from Blackmagic. Uh, we use a Mac for encoding. We tried a bunch of stuff, but it found out this is the most robust, flexible, and reliable system that we have been able to find. And that video is written straight to a spinning disk on the ship. Uh, as time permits, the, uh, the videos are moved off the spinning disk onto LTO tapes right on the boat. And as we record video, video files can get very large. So we chunk it up into 15-minute segments. We simultaneously write two streams. We write a... a very high resolution ProRes format, and we also write a web-friendly um, H.264 format. They're quite large. Uh, each file in the ProRes is about 25 gigabytes. The other one's about a tenth of that. And one critical component, if you're thinking about doing a video system, is you need to capture the creation time metadata of each video file. If you have that, then you can reassociate any moment in a video with um, position, temperature, salinity, any other uh, environmental data. We run about 140 dive operations on each ship a year. This equates to about 18,000 videos. That's about 250 terabytes of video data. It's a lot. Um, when that data comes back, we take, uh, we take, just pull the LTO tapes, walk them across the street to our LTO tape robot, and plug them in. Uh, we do write duplicates at the same time, so we have duplicates instantly. And once those files are on that system, it's available to the rest of our network. And this is the a simple diagram of our, uh, our annotation systems. Not so simple, I know. Uh, the first part is, as the videos appear, there's a little application that watches for this file system. As videos are written, it extracts metadata and registers them with our video asset manager. Once it's there, the videos are instantly accessible to all our other tools in our system. Now, the core of this is these microservices. We have about five of them. There's actually a few more, but these are the main ones. And these are toolkits for building video annotation applications. We're not suggesting the annotation app we build is the best in the world or the finest, but we have ways to improve or build additional ones as needed, or other people can build on top of them. These are all discrete microservices. 
When I talk about microservices, I mean the front end is just a REST API, so standard web API. Each microservice owns its own data. You, to get to that data, you go through the microservice. This way, your applications don't have to know anything about the, how the data is stored. Um, that way, you can modify the data store in the future. And each microservice does one thing and does it well. So it's rel they're relatively simple. Um, because they're independent, they're easy to upgrade and deploy. And they're also pretty scalable. We can throw a load balancer or a proxy in front of a service and scale them up as needed just by adding additional instances. They are language agnostic, so you can use your favorite programming language to work directly with the services. Yeah, thank you for the laughing at the Perl joke. <clears throat> and these are, we publish these all as Docker containers. They're publicly accessible, open source. If you want to customize it for your own institution, it's very simple. This is the example. There's the Docker file. You inherit from our Docker image. You throw in a couple configuration files telling where the database lives and a, a Java uh, a JDBC driver, and that's it. And then with two commands, you can have your one of these services up and running. <clears throat> a little bit about these services. The video asset service answers these basic questions. Where is the video? How do I get to it? What recorded the video? You know, what platform was it recorded on? When was the video recorded? So you, again, you have the date information from the video. Uh, the deployment ID, because remember, videos are chunks, so they're grouped together in deployments, so we need to be able to find related videos. <laughs> and then there's other video made of data that is also retrievable from the system. We provide a knowledge base. Uh, this defines an annotation terms, so it constrains what the annotators can use, and also provides some hierarchy, for example, phylogeny, which actually provides a lot of power when you want to do searches later, because if someone annotated a species of squid, you can actually go and do give me all annotations of any kind of squid that are available in the database. And spelling, and the important thing about the knowledge base is spelling really, really, really matters. Uh, for example, if you want a password, choose Cranchidate because no one can spell it even if they know what it is. Um, and the correct spelling, by the way, is the first one. And the, with the knowledge base, you can also use common names like cockatoo squid, greatly relieving your annotators. And when you do this, the knowledge base can insert, help you insert the correct um, scientific name into the database. Again, there's the annotation service, which is the core for storing the annotations. Annotations are really simple. It's a pointer to a video, an index into the video, so you know what frame that video annotation occurred, you know what the name of the concept that you annotated was. And then there's a lot of other metadata, timestamp, position temperature, uh, there's structured tags. You could say it was eating something, it was upon something, or you could write a localization bounding box within the frame. Oh, there's thousands of these options. And then we, for us, we wrote three applications for Ambara use. Uh, we have the annotation app interface for generating annotations, a query interface for retrieving them back, and a knowledge base for managing uh, the names you store in your knowledge base. Um, this is pretty key. You can modify it at any point, create new names. Uh, for example, CSIRO has their own custom knowledge base that looks very different from Mbari's. It's very easy to do and create one. Uh, our annotation interface is customizable by users, so when you log in, you get your own interface. Uh, it uses a constrained vocabulary from the knowledge base. It allows you to edit and add additional details. And you can also capture images and store them. Uh, and the nice thing about it is that users don't have to know where the video lives. They could just search for it by deployment ID and find the segment they want in there. And the query interface, again, is very flexible. It allows us to do queries like, I want to find all squid that were eating something between specific depths. So it allows researchers to ask very detailed questions. Now, we wrote this system with future proof in mind, so it's very modular. Uh, there are all the components independently evolve. For example, we use codecs that are not web friendly. So we use a native video player that's written for the specific platforms we're working on. Uh, you don't have to use our annotation application. It's easy to write your own annotation applications to talk to these services so we can do specialized applications in the future. And right now we're doing, there's a lot of work in the machine learning space. So one thing that we're doing is because we have all this annotated video, we can say, well, give me all, go and extract all the video frames from anything that's been annotated as uh, the Spicenex siphonophore nonomia by Juga, you can pull out all those images, run those through your machine learning algorithms, and use that for training them up. And then conversely, in the future, we hope that these machine learning algorithms can generate input that will be injected back into our annotation system, 
and then we can use whatever other tools that we've developed to edit, approve of, or modify those machine learning generated annotations. Uh, all these tools are open source. Uh, we provide Docker images on Docker Hub, and all the code is available on GitHub. Um, and we encourage people to use them or contribute, or at least if you have questions, please contact us. And that's all I have, so thank you very much.